Hey, it's Tobin, and this is Fuzzy Tolerance Podcasts. We'll call it number nine, and we're going to take a look at the quality of life dashboard. In other words, I couldn't think of anything else to talk about, so I'll talk about something I'm working on here and there at the moment. Now, the quality of life dashboard is a quality of life uh, or neighborhood health kind of application. It's a collaboration between the city of Charlotte and UNCC and Mecklenburg County, and we're also working with the towns, and we're also working with the U.S. Census data. Uh, you're probably involved in this project and don't even know it. There are a lot of hats in the ring. But it's basically a neighborhood health type of application where you can look at a number of different metrics for neighborhoods and get an idea of what's going on. Uh, the neighborhoods in this case were defined by UNCC and they are based on census block boundaries. A neighborhood can have one or more census blocks in it, but a census block won't be uh, bisected by a neighborhood boundary. So the census data will, will jump right in very easily. Now, I thought I'd talk about this for a couple reasons. One, there's, I've already released the code because there's a long time between now and when the project goes live. I've heard dates for all the data being ready anywhere from June to December. So it's probably going to be a long time before the project is done. And there's not a whole lot left to do on it at this point. The other reason is uh, there's been talk of making the site look more like uh, charmac.org. Oh my god! Which means it could get ugly. Um, and I wanted you to see it now just in case it did so you, you won't think so badly of me. Now, I'll just show you how it works a little bit. And then, which won't take very long, it's made to be as simple as possible. And then tell you, show you some code for a few things that I did here that I haven't done other places or that I think is kind of neat. And I'll put links to all this stuff in the show notes. Now you can go here and, you know, change the uh, shading uh, to no one commutes. We have a subway metric. Mecklenburg County doesn't have any subways in it. <laughs> okay. Uh, but you can see, you can, you know, chloroplast the map very easily. You can pick a neighborhood either by searching for a location, either an address or a place or a road name or a parcel identifier. The search right now is being powered by one of our web services for our data. It's actually part of the REST-ish uh, web service framework we open source a while back but you could use Google Maps geocoder here too so you can pick a address by a, or a location like so it will go and pull up see commute by bus commute by bus here's the neighborhoods doing the county average what the indicator is related metrics so you can jump to uh, related things See, this one has a pie chart in it, too. Why it's important, technical notes, data source, blah, blah, blah. You see, as you pick a different thing over here, it'll change this. You can you can change this, um, and it'll change the stuff over here. So everything's linked together. And on the welcome screen, you add a couple. It just picks three random percentage metrics, and you can actually click on that, and it'll you know change everything, too. So that's how you interact with the site. Very straightforward. The really only other thing you can do is say print a report. And since we have 124 selected, that's what's up there now. You can pick some different metrics. It's going to go off and generate a PDF report with some non-Latin text here at some point. There's a map of the neighborhood. Yes, I am stretching it. I apologize to the cartographic gods everywhere. And then here's your, you know, stuff. Commute by railroad and subway. We don't have a subway in Mecklenburg County. A subway uh, walking. Mm, nobody walks there. Bunch of non-walkers. Anyway, that's how it works. Very straightforward, very easy to use. It's designed to be as easy to use as I could figure out how to make it. 
Now the infrastructure is different for us. It's Google Fusion Tables. I've used that for some like open data stuff before. I haven't used it in an application. Now, the great things about Fusion Tables for this particular project one is this project involves a lot of coral plething and a lot of changing the map styling. With Fusion Tables that is extremely easy to do on the fly. Basically it's like a this little function, you're basically making a little JSON object with some styling notations in it. Where you, and here I'm doing for type range, which is the only type I have right now. If it's, you know, you're using, it looks like SQL. If it's greater than this or less than this, color it this way. Very, very easy to do. And it's just very easy for that. The other reason why I want to do that is I wanted to make the data as open as possible. Now, open data I generally put into three buckets. There's the download bucket. In other words, go to my FTP site, Shushu. And that's great for like GIS professionals who have the infrastructure and software to uh, manage and manipulate GIS data. The second bucket I put open data initiatives into is, uh, is for lack of a better word, straining like GeoRSS or KML or GeoJSON or GeoJSON. Um, and that is great for like an intermediate level developer or a non-GIS developer. They don't need their own infrastructure back end. They can take it live and mash it up with other data and do their stuff. Now the third bucket, which is where we should really strive to, is that you need the first two buckets but you also need a way for non-technical people to be able to interact with the data, get their hands on it and do stuff with it. And that's what Google Fusion Tables allows. So we can go here and directly access the data. You're seeing all the data that makes up this table. All the columns from geometry to, you know, everything. You can filter it any way you want. You can visualize it as a map. You can get a KML link or export it to KML. You can visualize it as charts and get embeddable code and put that right in your web page. So a non-technical user can see and interact with the data. And that's what open data, data really needs to be. Downloads and streaming are great, but you're servicing a very small subset of the population that way. So that's the other reason why I want to use fusion tables is it's very easily allows data to be very open. Now there's a fourth bucket for open data I sometimes throw in which is like social. Let people interact with the data and each other. I know less about being social than anyone in the world. So sometimes I'll leave that bucket off. So it's the Google Maps API, Google Fusion Tables. It's using jQuery. Use the jQuery UI for a couple things uh, like the uh, autocomplete here and the video tutorial, like dialog boxes. Right now, it's you'll get rickrolled. So sad. I was, in, I was in the meeting and and I showed him. This is where the tutorial video would go. And I showed him and I started playing Rick Ashley. Nobody got it. Nobody got what a rickroll was. I weep for the future. Anyway. That's how the site works. That's how what the whole framework is. It's all client-side code except for the PDF report. The PDF report is PHP and FPDF. So there it is. Let's look at a few things that I think are neat. First, just a boring thing. It's a responsive design. So as you get, as you shrink, you'll see it's two columns. It'll go to one column. The uh, title at the top will shrink down to a smaller font and you know all that happy stuff so it'll work well on a uh, you know whatever you got a phone or a you know that happy stuff so responsive design that's nothing you haven't seen before it's basically just some media queries when it gets to 800 pixels do one thing 620 pixels do something else 400 do something else. If you've done a good job with with solid web design, this is a piece of cake. 
if you didn't do a good job of solid web design, you'll 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 hate life. But it's got responsive design. This top bit here is a gradient. It's not an image. You, the fewer images you can load, the better. It's not only is it a size issue, it's the number of round trips to the server to get those. A web browser can only do so many queries at a time to, the, to a single URL for resources. And you can go into about config in Firefox and, and up that quite a bit. But generally, better to not do that with images if you can. That is just a gradient. I kind of like this uh, ultimate CSS gradient generator. I think that yellow is just this yellow. And that, and that's all it is. And it'll give you a bunch of code with all the different hacks for all the different browsers. Uh, gradient is a CSS3 feature and uh, is not supported across the board. I'm looking at you, Internet Explorer. So that's the top gradient. Now the JavaScript, you might notice this Google map is very low, low tone. You really don't want to use Google's default map for their default map style for things like this because it's just too bright and distracting. You don't want to see the data behind it that much. Now a great site, and again I'm going to put all these links in the show notes, or a great great post on this was on mapsys.info, just has a ton of examples of different ways you can style the map with JSON samples for each. Just it, it, It's a really great resource. You can do subdued tones, you can do gray scales, you can do, here's a kind of a sepia. Uh, I just have a, a million examples. Really great resource. So I toned down that, and toning down that is really, I mean, this little style feature here. You're just setting different things off or changing their color a little bit. It's, it's very easy to do. So tone down map. Now the fusion tables, uh, you, I think I showed you how to, that was just very easy to style that. The legend, the sample code for uh, the legend on Google Fusion sample site was, was kind of awful. Um, so I redid that in jQuery and then I discovered one of the reasons why it's so awful is it takes a while for the map to load this div to contain the legend on it. So what was happening is I would, you know, make a div and tell the map to, you know, append it. And then I was putting the, the legend stuff in it. Well, I was putting a legend stuff in before the thing had gotten there. And the first time that box came up is just empty, which is not what I was looking for. So I basically made that div a permanent page feature hidden behind the map. And then I put that stuff there, and then whenever Google Maps got around to dropping that div on top of the map, it would it would be there. So, in case you ever run into that, that's what's going on. So, I swore for you, so you won't have to. Now, all this stuff, the the metrics and the reports and the charts, is driven by a single. I just have this metrics.json, and JSON is just. JavaScript object notation. It's basically everything in JavaScript is an object. It's, it's, it's as object oriented as object oriented can be. Um, and this is basically data. You could store this stuff in a database, but there's just really not a great reason to save your round trip connection penalty to a database. But it's like, see this character one is the fake character metric. There's a description, the importance, technical notes, source, links. Uh, the style determines how the map and legend work. See, it's type range. Here are the breaks. And over here to the, the right are the colors. And the unit type is percentage. Now, this total commuters is just raw numbers. So you see for units, there's nothing in there. That affects basically this percentage sign, that, that percentage sign. So you can see what the units are. So this drives the whole site. This populates the print report elements. This populates this drop down. It populates and runs everything. And that makes it really easy. If I wanted to add a new metric, I could just, you know, copy one of these, you know, paste a new one, 
change the the field that's the actual Google Fusion Tables field name and the other stuff and it it would all be driven including the report the PHP loads the same JSON file so to use a site for something else really all you'd have to do is uh, change this metrics JSON and change the uh, center point and zoom level for Google Maps where it starts out along with the uh, Fusion Tables API table ID and, and you're good to go. So I, I made this, I figured I was going to open source this, I made this as easy as I could think to do at the time for somebody else to use this, this site for something else. You see everything's built, this all came from that configuration file. The, uh, let's see, the quick links, this is just a very easy way to link from one thing to another in here. And that was very simple. Let's see, where did I put the quick links? Quick links, basically, it takes what you're picking and makes it selected in the drop down, changes the fusion label tile, and it triggers the change event for that drop down list. And then if there's an object, if there is a active record, if you have neighborhood picked out, It'll, it'll show all the stuff in there. The reason being is there's also a list of all the metrics and you could pick one and if you didn't have a neighborhood selected it would just change the map and not jump somewhere else. Look there's subway. We don't have any subways in Mecklenburg County. Anyway, there is uh, the quick links. You know, might note this area fades in a little bit when it comes up. Now that's done in JavaScript, that's a little jQuery. Here's the thing with animations. You can do animations in CSS3 and you can do them in JavaScript. The benefit of doing them in CSS3 is they will be hardware accelerated on a lot of platforms. That'll make them much smoother and easier. And also it's arguably a styling thing, so it, it really belongs in, in CSS. It's, it's the more semantic thing to put it there. The problem is, yeah, and you should do that if it's like something that's not very important. If it's something that has to work or your page breaks, then you want to do that in JavaScript. Now here I'm doing it in JavaScript because that's, that's kind of an important thing. And all that is really is, uh, let's see if I can find an example here is basically it on that click event it hides the other two divs that could be there and then it just fades in over the course of a second the one you want very simple jQuery stuff now Google Charts see I have this kind of chart here and some random metric charts up here the Google Charts API is what I use for that and if you've ever used that before, you're basically just building a URL. Well, there's, there's actually two ways to make Google Charts. There's the API for a image chart, and then there's like a interactive chart that's SVG or VML, depending on whether you get Internet Explorer or not. Um, the reason why I went with the image charts is because the, the, the SVG VML ones don't always work on mobile devices. They're not as easy to scale automatically as you're resizing the browser window or as your device gets smaller. And you really can't put those in, say, PDF, whereas you could put an image there. And I wanted those charts to be the same when you go across the website and the PDF. So I use the images. Uh, the Google Charts has this image editor. It's actually on AppSpot. And... Um, you can just fiddle around and see how it builds this URL and then customize how it builds that URL in your code. So we're basically building this URL and, and appending some arguments onto it. And that's it. And that makes your charts. The URL is ugly. Um, I mean, Google has a good reason for it, though. These... Arguments are, are very 
nonsensical, but since it's doing a get request and you're sending a lot of information, you don't want to run out of your limit for a get request, which is, I can't remember how many characters, but it doesn't go on forever. So that's why there aren't like big, long descriptive titles for those arguments. It sucks, but it sucks for a reason. Yeah. Another neat thing is this Google Translate. I'd never used this before. So we can select a language and say, let's see this in Welsh. I don't know. Well, there it is in Welsh. And the neat thing about Google Translate is you'll see it came up in English and then it translated for you. So, and you can look at the original text for all these different languages. And that is unbelievably easy to do. I, I can't believe I've never done it before. But, but it, it once you inactivate it, this text didn't exist before I clicked that, is, is the point. It, it continues to do it if the page changes. Now, that's uh, this Google Translate tool. It basically, you just build what it, it how you want it, and you just get the script to stick on your page, and you are essentially done and it'll just work. It is fantastic. So translate FPDF, making that PDF page. FPDF is uh, uh, PDF. I always get worried about searching because safe search is off on Google and sometimes it does weird things when you start putting F in there. Anyway, FPDF, uh, it is basically a PDF library for PHP that does not use the uh, uh, license odd PDF uh, bits. So it's a pure library without using the PDF lib library. That's pure PHP. And you can stick images in there. You can do all kinds of stuff. It's a really hand, making PDF sucks. Oh, it sucks so bad. I hate making PDFs. I probably spend, for this site that does all this stuff, I probably spend as much time on that PDF as I did on everything else. I hate making PDFs. But if you have to, FPDF for PHP is, is a really good way to go. And that code's in there, and it's loading that JSON. Uh, uh, get form variables. Here we're getting that metrics.json. And PHP is very good. It bas basically decodes JSON as arrays, is what it does. But then we're requesting uh, code, or making select stick request to fusion tables through their SQL API for all their stuff. Make a cover page and you see this is much easier than normal but you still have to like go to a certain lines and cells and set fonts and oh, I hate PDFs. God, just, ah. right here we're adding a map. This is the only time I cheated where it's not using fusion tables. One of the things fusion tables can't do for you is give you the extent of a feature. You could, in theory, download or like get the geometry and then take all the coordinates in it and loop through them and kind of build a boundary. But, you know, who, life's too short. So I just hit that on one of our, our restish uh, web services and get the extent. And then I hit our WMS server on GeoServer to, to put that map on a page. Then I just have a function for all the measures. Here's code that I kind of wish would work, but doesn't. And here's where it loops through all of these selected measures and, and puts those on the page. So not not bad. All right, 260 lines to make a PDF report? Pfft, I can live with that. Anyway, that's some of the kind of interesting, haven't really done a lot of it before stuff on quality of life dashboard. The code is out there on GitHub, my first GitHub project. I had been using Google code, but all the cool kids are on GitHub, and I figured I had to learn Git at some point. I have to say, it's not that different 
uh, command line wise from Mercurial that I'd notice, at least for the level of stuff I do. I, I have a soft spot for Mercurial. It's kind of a neater. G Git on the back end is a little messier, but I like it so far. And there's the code. If you've never been to GitHub, it's a can be a little unintuitive, but if you look up top, you'll see options to uh, just download it all. And uh, off you'll go. Now this should run perfectly on any web server you want to put it on, with the exception of the PDF reporting. You'll need to have PDF enabled. And that might be it. You might need curl for where it queries fusion tables. But I think that'd be about it, and, and, and then that should work too. Anyway, that is the quality of life dashboard, the thing that sucked a few hours out of my life. But I think it's going to be a really neat project. It's come out looking really good. It's really easy to use. It's fast. It has a lot of functionality and a lot of stuff we might use for other projects down the road. And the code is all open source MIT licensed, so do what you want with it. And if you see anything that can be done better, and since it's still in development, there's a lot of rough code here and there, I'm sure you will, please let me know. I'd appreciate it. Anyway, that is this podcast. I will see you next month. Bye-bye.